Hello, I'm Jesse Weiler here with Sister Anne Marie Check. Sister is a member of the Carmelite Sisters of the Divine Heart of Jesus and the Superior of St. Joseph's Home of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Sister, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And uh, as we do always on our show, would you mind leading us in prayer to start? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us, inspire us, and breathe into us your life and the love of the Father. Help us to share with one another the glories of God's mercy and the beauty of his creation. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and with the prayers of our Father, St. Joseph, our Lady of our Queen of Mount Carmel, all the angels and saints. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise Amen. be Jesus Christ. <laughs> now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much. Now we always greet each other. Well, so. good. That's a good way to do it. Uh, okay, so uh, we obviously, uh, you're religious here. We haven't had a lot of Carmelites on the show, but I'm very interested on, in how you found this this community and uh you know what what made you interested in joining what's your vocation story well it was uh it, it was um not expected i was working as a high school intern in grand rapids michigan at st anne's home and uh, i was just trying to get out of high school my my goal since kindergarten has been to get out of school and so I was just looking forward to getting my diploma and getting getting out. And I was working with the sisters, and um, I was not thinking about about joining them in particular or any other congregation. It wasn't that I wasn't thinking about religious life at all, but I wasn't actively going around to communities. I wasn't doing all of the discernment things that people normally do. I was concentrating on my, my life at home and on, um, on mostly thinking about going to college, I guess. And I had no aspirations in any particular way, but I prayed every day that God would, would show me his will. And um, I told him, I said, Lord, I, I don't, I don't want to goof this up. <laughs> so you tell me, I won't go looking. You know, you want me to get married to somebody, you want me to go to a convent, you want me to do this, do that, then drop it on my head. I'm not going to go looking for it. And he did, because he always answers our prayers somehow. And one day when I was walking out of St. Anne's um, to go home at the end of my work there, I was struck by uh, a knowledge and kind of an interior an interior knowledge, it wasn't a feeling, it wasn't an emotion, it was a certainty, that's how I describe it, that I belonged with these sisters. And that if it cost me everything I had, if it cost me my home and my family and all of my possessions and my entire life as I knew it up to that point, that it would be worth it. Even if, you know, in that instant, in that very minute, I had had to drop everything and um, go there, then I would be able to do it, and I would be happy to do it. And so I was very young. I was 18, and I, you know, which these days, I guess, is, is maybe a little bit unusual, um, but I graduated from high school, and I left for the convent that fall. Oh, I entered on September the 8th. It was 2006, <laughs> a lot longer ago than... <laughs> Than it seems, isn't it? But. So, as a as a younger uh, person searching out their vocation, what were some of those struggles that that you had that might have been different from other religious sisters? Well, I would say that there was a, there was a lot of a, when I entered. You know, there's there was a, there were there were there was a cup there were a couple. There was at least, there, there were a couple of younger sisters who were even, there was one even my age, who was actually a month younger than me. 
uh, from Ireland. And, uh, but we were teenagers. And even if you, you know, enter a community or, or if you were to get married really young or, or have some sort of large responsibility at a young age, I think the expectation that you have of yourself is that you will kind of get this infusion of maturity to go with it. And that's not the way it works. <laughs> There's no way to circumvent the growing up process. You just have to do it in a certain context. So I was a teenager and thank God for the, you know, that the older sisters were patient with me. I mean, we, we still had giggle fits. We still had, you know, uh, acne problems. You know, we were, we were so young, you know, we slid down banisters and, uh, and uh, caused all kinds of emotional disturbances, but we did it in, in the context of the religious life. And I don't think it would work out for everybody the way it worked out for me, but it was, it was a call from God and it was genuine. And um, no matter how no matter what perspective I take looking back, I know that I did the right thing and I'm awfully glad I did, you know, as an 18 year old, which once again, is not something that a lot of 18 year olds would, would want to or should do with their lives. But for me, it was right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me oh. now? Okay. Okay. I don't yes, know what. Now I, can. <laughs> I don't know what went wrong right. with there. I apologize. What, I don't know either. <laughs> what was it about the Carmelite spirituality that really drew you in? And was there a possibility in your mind of maybe looking at some other communities too? Well, I always, uh, I was always attracted to St. Francis and the Franciscans. I love the, um, I love the, the spirit of joy, the love of poverty, the, the freedom of sharing in the Franciscan life. I love St. Francis. He's, he's, he's wonderful. And, and St. Clair are uh, really inspirational saints to me. But I think that Carmel itself was um, kind of contained to everything. There was nothing lacking. Every devotion that I had was contained in Carmel. I uh, read uh, the story of a soul, L'Histoire du Nam, by um, Saint Therese of Lisieux, when I was pretty young, a, 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 you know, a little girl, and I, she was such a kindred spirit. I understood everything that she was talking about, and it was so wonderful to see put into words experiences that I had had. Um, I always say, you know, two French girls understand each other. And when I got a little older in my teens and I started reading Teresa of Avila, I saw Carmel as sort of this, um, you know, kind of the ultimate, the ultimate vocation. So, of course, I didn't aspire to it, you know, myself, because I'd be like, you know, wishing yourself the president of the United States or the Pope or something. No, it's kind of, it's, an, it's presumptuous to imagine yourself, you know, to have something so perfect. So... I um, I think that I I don't think I would have chosen Carmel for myself, not because I didn't want it the most, but because I didn't think I deserved it. And uh, the same with religious life; it was something that I didn't I didn't presume to imagine myself as being as being a, a sister or a nun. I really um, had to wait for for God to tell me what he wanted. Also, there was a community of um, cloistered, discalced Carmelite nuns by, um, not, not that nearby, but on occasionally when I was in grade school, my mom would wake me up like five o'clock on Wednesday morning and take me to 6.30 a.m. mass there. And I was always enchanted by that monastery and those nuns. Um, uh, you know, our sisters are not cloistered, but once again, it, it kind of, our community has, has everything. We have the, the spirit and the lifestyle and the, of the rhythm of the contemplative, the cloistered life in many ways, but we also have the, uh, the, the apostolic element, the element of, of, of service to, to, the, 
to the world in a physical sense. And so I felt with Carmel of the Divine Heart of Jesus, I didn't have to choose. I didn't have to, I didn't have to pick one or the other. I got to choose all, which is St. Teresa's big thing, right? I choose all. You know, I get I get everything. I don't have to to you know pick one thing and then leave something behind. I have all my devotions, all the all the wishes that I had to be fulfilled in Carmel. We're, we'll get into the the Carmelite spirituality in a little bit uh, for the second part of our interview, but to kind of lead us into that, um, you you talked about choosing all. You talked about devotions, and and one of the questions I always have about religious communities is, how do you uh, find an individual expression of that spirituality in your community amongst uh, a community that has you know structures and stability and unitive prayer and all of that? Well. Um... I think that because, you know, because it's God, <laughs> we don't have to worry about, um, you know, we're, we're, you know the, the religious life in general is designed and the spiritual life, the goal is to make you become, you know, most perfectly you. And every soul, I, I, I think I read this somewhere, I wish I could remember who said it. Somebody said something that... Um, each soul is a universe unto itself. So there's no um, there's no such thing as a a, a, a tree sort that that quenches or or um, or subdues a proper individual spirit. However, now here's the thing: is that in a worldly sense, we're taught that what makes us ourselves, that what makes me me is all of this external superfluous stuff that doesn't matter. My accent, my culture, my ethnicity, the clothes I wear, my opinions about politics or about, you know, whether to vacuum or dust a room first when I go to clean it, the food I like, my my hobbies, my talents, all of those are things about me, but they don't make me myself. And the more I relegate those things to their proper place, which is not to say that they're not important and they're not useful, but they have a proper place. And their place is not in identifying who I am or giving me my worth. I can lose all of that stuff and still be me. And religious life is supposed to give you that back. It's supposed to give you your identity back. It's supposed to show you who you truly are. Therefore, a lot of the structures and you know elements like you know we. Have what? Similar you know, schedule of the day, eat the same food, that sort of thing. None of those things could possibly diminish who I am as an individual. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that again. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, and I think you put it quite beautifully. And that was uh, that's a great way of understanding that those external things do not make us, and if they went away, we'd still be us. I, that's what I'm going to take away from that. And and uh, you know, going into Carmelite spirituality, I think you know people are very aware of Franciscan, you know, simplicity, all of that. Dominicans, preachers, and teachers, all of that. What is at the core of Carmelite spirituality? This is the big question, isn't it? Nobody can define Carmel, and it, it drives everyone nuts. So the best uh, summary that I ever heard from our good father, Ralph Elias, uh, over here, we, I think he's in Washington, D.C. now, but he was our spiritual um, director and confessor at the Mother House in, in Milwaukee uh, when I was a novice. He said, prayer and the presence of God. Those are the two When you boil everything down, those are the two elements of the Carmelite charism. And to understand what that means, you have to...
Uh, looks like we lost connection with sister. I'm going to try and get her back here. One second here. And that's a, a real shame because I was re really liking that uh, her answer to that. So I am uh, I'm going to try her one more time just to see if we can uh, get reconnected here. Um, it does not seem that she's able to answer my call. So, but we will keep trying because we need to have this conversation for uh, for all of you out there who are interested in this uh, topic. I certainly am as well about Carmelite spirituality. So, oh, looks like we have a connection here. One second. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. We're back. Sorry. Uh, we're right at the good part of the whole conversation. So, you were talking oh, okay. about... What was you I were talking about? You were, <laughs> you were talking Arizona. about your uh, your priest friend who was able to to describe uh, Carmelite spirituality. Prayer and the presence of God, right? The two elements of the Carmelite charism. Okay, so what this means, what a care, what the the quality of a charism, and this is the way I I, I explain it to people, is not that um, is not that. Carmelites are the, you know, have some sort of a corner on prayer and the practice of the presence of God. And um, it's that, okay, so look at, um, look at the, the, the Franciscans, you know, and one of their charisms is, is, their, is their witness of poverty, right? I mean, that's kind of, you know, tends to spring to your mind, you know, when you think of Franciscans. Now, clearly, the Franciscans aren't the only ones who practice poverty, um, and not and not only you know practice it, but um, you know have you know very beautiful, um, beautiful and exciting witness to it. So, uh, but if the Franciscans ever quit practicing their holy poverty and having joy in their holy poverty, there's no hope for the rest of us, is there? You know. The Dominicans, you know, Our Lady gave St. Dominic the rosary, right? Now, we all pray rosary. You know, I have a rosary on my belt somewhere over here, and uh, we pray the rosary every day. The Dominicans ever give up on the rosary. There's no hope for the rest of us, right? So with Carmel, the idea, the practice of, of prayer, especially contemplative prayer, which is... Concentrate tends to um, concentrate more on the on the listening part of prayer than on the speaking and thinking part of prayer, and um, it's the part that comes from God that we can't force to happen. We prepare our souls for contemplation by meditating, by keeping ourselves recollected throughout the day, and then. Contemplation is, is God's part in our prayer, and that comes without our, uh, without our input <laughs> all the time. So now every, every, every spirituality, every, every Christian Catholic you know, spirituality um, leads into that. You know, contemplation is, is not the exclusive property of the Carmelites, nor do we have the only only um, only window into contemplation but if the, if the Carmelites give up on, um, on contemplative prayer there's no hope for anybody else <laughs> so that's how I think of it and with the, the presence of God part um, I think of Elijah that's where Carmel finds its roots is in Holy Scripture and I always say that everything that you need to know about Carmel is told in um, in the in in the story of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Everything else is commentary. 
everything that St. Teresa of Avalon, St. John of the Cross, and um, all, all the other great Carmelite saints, all of that is, is um, building and extrapolating and explaining what uh, the prophet Elijah gave us. And what's the first thing he told us? He said, the Lord God lives before whose face I stand, the presence of God. And that's how you live your life. That's how you pray. That's your witness to the world is that the Lord your God lives before whose face I stand. So I'm trying to kind of piece all of this together. And what I'm taking from this is that, you know, we have all these aspects of Christianity and, and Catholicism and beyond just religious communities, there's apostolates and dioceses and all of this. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of the sense that I'm getting is that the Carmelite spirituality is almost like the glue that holds all of this together and inter interconnecting and intertwining everything together universally. Is that Makes sense. Well, I'm. I think that Carmel's gift to the church is um, is prayer. Is is shedding a light on prayer, and we know that without prayer, there is no communion. There's no. Um, there's no um, connection. That's our, you know, we talk a lot in the world about communication and connectivity and dialogue and, and, and information sharing. Well, prayer is kind of the, the highest form, kind of the only, the only form that really counts when it comes down to it. It's our only way of, um, of being with God. It's our only real, you know, truly our only way of, of being with the communion of saints and of, of helping our brothers and sisters. This is why we can have um, cloistered or aeromedical um, people who are not there because they're misanthropes, because they don't care for humanity or for the world, but because they care so much that they'll live a life of service of prayer, which is hidden, which is not thanked or recognized but it's the most useful thing to be done. And it reaches across, across oceans, across continents, mountains, all that stuff. And, you know, what did our Lord say you know, to, to Martha and Mary? He said, Mary has chosen the better part. Well, why? Because she preferred to sit at the feet of the Lord. And what he needed Martha to understand was that action and contemplation are not opposed that in fact the one eventually becomes the other when it becomes perfect you know contemplation is action and leads to action and inspires action on behalf of our brothers and sisters and action done perfectly brings us into the presence of the lord so they culminate to each other Again, really, really well said. Uh, the last thing I, I want to get into, because I think it's incredibly important, is that, you know, we have, we've talked about the expression and the individuality and all of this, but the universal nature of all of this is the, is the sacramental nature, right? The sacramental aspect of, of what you're doing is mutually enriching, mutually enriching of the contemplation and everything else that you're doing throughout the day, and maybe not mutually enriching, but the source of all of that. So can you tell me about how the Carmelite spirituality and the sacramental life coincide and how they work together? Well, yeah, any religious life is a, um, an expression of, of the, the fullest expression of the sacrament of baptism, right? You know, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's part of that. You know, that's why that's why religious life itself is is not a sacrament because it's tied to the sacrament of, of, of baptism. You know, it's not like being ordained, you know, or something like that. But um, so it, this is kind of the you know living a religious life is an attempt at living you know in kind of a shadowed way, a veiled way, if you will, what we will all live you know forever in heaven. And the, um, the essence of all the sacraments 
is a you know a, a an exterior sign of a of a hidden grace of a hidden reality, right? So, Carmelite life is um, is defined and and expressed absolutely, you know, sacramentally in the sacramental life. Um, ever since the beginning, when the hermits had their 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 little their little caves and hovels on on Mount Carmel, there was an oratory, you know, um, dedicated to Our Lady of this place, so Our Lady of Mount Carmel, um, at which in our in our rule given us by um, St. Albert of Jerusalem, it says that an oratory, a chapel, will be constructed somewhere in the middle of all the cells where all the, the, um, the brothers, the hermits, can meet every day for Holy Mass. And we still meet for Holy Mass every day. And it's our, it's the, it defines the rhythm of our life. And as an extension of that sacrament, then, you have the liturgy of the hours, which is tied in tied to the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. You have the um, the expressions of of the other the other sacraments, you know, confession and the sick. All of them are um, belong in religious life, and we couldn't do without them. That's that's um, that's how we, you know, those are kind of the the. the the big rocks that we build our life on. And I would also say that our congregation specifically uh, was founded by the um, uh, Blessed Maria Teresa of St. Joseph and her expression to the Lord was, if you come, I come. She would not build a house before she had permission to build a chapel with the Blessed Sacrament there. She wouldn't, she wouldn't live in a place where she couldn't have the Blessed Sacrament there. To, um, to be with, to for her to be to adore and be with the sisters and to protect and guide the communities, and we maintain that we, um, it's absolutely the first and most important thing in our house is our generator, our chapel. <laughs> And, and maybe actual an actual generator, depending on uh, <laughs> your your needs for your community. So we always we always say that you know that's the generator room. Yeah, that's <laughs> the chapel. Well, I love it. I love it. It's the power. It's the source. So, uh, sister, thank you so much for for joining us today. Um, if people want to find out, me. if they want to find out where they can you know go to get more information about your community, where can they go to find out? Well, I would start. We have a website, um, CarmeliteDCJNorth.org. Uh, we also are on Facebook, and um, what you know, Carmel, Carmel DCJ North is our province. There's also a province in the, out of um, Kirkwood, Missouri. That's also our sisters, and um, we are international. And um, that's those are probably the best ways to get the the names and the. Of the, of the different convents and, and where they're located. All right. Uh, well, you know, I posted a link to uh, your website there in the chat. So that will be there Great. as this video yeah. is, is hosted in perpetuity. Sister, again, thank you so much for your time and uh, well, thank you. very comforting words, you know. And, and I think, like you said, it can be a difficult thing to talk about and explain. But I thought you did a very good job of helping us to understand what is Carmelite spirituality. And what's more, I think it's certainly going to impact my my individual prayer life, because I think what's great about, you know, the the vocation that I have is um, married life is that I get to absorb anything that, that I want or can do. So uh, not unlike the things that you were talking about, which is great. So Well, anytime I love to talk about prayer. <laughs> <laughs> it's very clear. It's very clear. And and thank you in, in a, for being a generator for the rest of the church. I think that's incredibly important. And I think that's what the Carmelites bring. Uh, to the church as well. So thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. You're welcome. God bless. Pray for one another. God bless you too.